Um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's start with something very banal. Does a film get made in the cutting room? <laughs> well, uh, it certainly can be ruined in the cutting room, and it certainly can be made better, but if it's not good to begin with, I think you can only do so much. But it certainly is a terribly critical part of, of filmmaking, and um, that's why I think perhaps the best directors are very knowledgeable about editing and enjoy participating in editing themselves. Um, certainly the director I work with directs the editing. He's always in the editing room with me after he's through shooting. And certain people like Kurosawa, from what I understand, cut his own films, actually, um, with a few assistants. Um, I think it's, a very, it, it's very good for directors to know about editing. They should all learn about editing as quickly as possible if they want to be good directors. Are there some that don't? Yes, I think there are a lot of uh, directors, particularly now, when so many people are directing uh, for the first time, who rely heavily on a very good cameraman to try and help them understand how to shoot a film, and a, an editor to, to uh, then take that footage and try and make it work. But it's not necessarily going to work if um, it's not shot properly, not conceived properly. And um, that's why I, I try and encourage all film students in, to, to learn about editing as quickly as they can. You said to me yesterday when we were talking about it, it just comes up now and what comes back to mind in what you're saying, that you never go on a film set while the film is being shot. Um, from what you now say, wouldn't it appear almost essential for you to be there in order to avoid such mistakes in shooting? Have the director avoid such mistakes in shooting? Well, the director I work for doesn't need that help uh, because he's a great editing director. Uh, he's, he's a great editor himself. Uh, so uh, he doesn't need my help, but a lot of uh, first-time directors do need that help, and these days a lot of editors are on the set a lot to try and make sure that things are being shot so they will cut together, because literally, as some of you probably know, you can shoot film in a way that will not actually edit together. Um, if you don't photograph the two shot of us and the close-ups in the proper way, it will look funny when it's cut together. Those are some pretty basic things that uh, people can be advised to avoid. Uh, and these days there are a lot of editors on the sets <laughs> doing that. Um, every time between questions, if you have any from down there, please show us that you do. Um, editing has always been considered classically to be the creative moment in the filmmaking process, at least in the classic period of when uh, Podovkin and Arnheim and everybody started creating the first aesthetics of cinema, they thought that actually cinema was created in the cutting room. Um, then we had cinema verite and we had television and we had all sorts of other ingredients that came into the movie making business. And um, in television, for example, you hardly get any time for cutting. Um, so there's been a development to uh, make it less important. At the same time, uh, if we didn't have people like you who make it central, then we wouldn't have the films that we actually see in the cinemas. Uh, do you think there's any danger that editing will be uh, slowly discarded as a creative tool? No, it won't be discarded, but the pressures on editors are getting uh, horrendous in Hollywood. I know that on, I haven't seen the film myself, but The Fugitive, I understand, has six editors listed on in the main titles, which is astonishing to me. I mean, it's bad enough having two editors or three editors on a film because I think you can't have a, uh, a, a stamp on the film then, either the director or the editor. And uh, there are many directors who like to work that way. For example, Francis Coppola often works with multi-editors and, and edits himself on video what they have already edited, so there are four editors at least. But um, six editors <laughs> is really beginning to get out of hand, perhaps because it was an adventure film and there were so many special effects that you could literally take, say, one sequence that was very difficult and hand it to one editor and give another sequence to another and it wouldn't really matter. On a film like The Age of Innocence, however, I think where uh, it, it took a long time for us to find the right style for the film, the right pace for the film, because it was so subtle, and you had to, people were saying one thing and, and feeling another, 
how long you dwelled on an actor became a very critical thing, whereas in Goodfellas, of course, the opposite was the truth. Uh, the film had such momentum and power, and it should have been very jagged because towards the end, of course, when he's on a cocaine high, Scorsese wanted to give the feeling to the audience of what was that, that was like. So we found we could truncate and jump cut and smash things together, and the more we did that, the better it was. But with Age of Innocence, it was really uh, the opposite. And we had to find, Scorsese and I, the right pace for that film. And the thought that six people might be trying to do that, I, I just don't think it would work. So one of the things that many directors like Spielberg and Lucas and Scorsese are trying to do is get more time back for editors. The, the editing schedules are getting shorter and shorter. The pressure is getting greater and greater. And the way Hollywood tries to solve that is by putting more editors on. And I think you begin to see that sometimes in, in, in the films, the result of that. Uh, so it's, a, it's something we're going to try very hard in the future to make the studios understand is, is not helping filmmaking at all. You don't think that of the six people on The Fugitive, five had just been fired? I don't think so from what I understand, but you might be right. <laughs> that, of course, does happen a lot. But... Um, How are you doing down there? Anything cooking? <laughs> no questions. <laughs> no, really? Not a one. Okay. We talk about editing for a long time. It's the center <laughs> of everything. Um, any, anything that you think that you have invented? Well, I, I, I think that Scorsese always uh, has an editing conception for his films when he begins to conceive them, when he writes them, co-writes them, when he shoots them. And I think he has uh, reintroduced certain things, which were actually sometimes uh, introduced by other directors in earlier times. Uh, freeze frames, for example, which were used in Goodfellas, obviously, come out of the Nouvelle Vague. And uh, I, I think that he um, has reintroduced into mainstream filmmaking uh, unconventional editing styles. The, the, the editing style of Hollywood tends to be one that's rather slick. Uh, the smooth, unnoticed edit. Um, as some editors I've heard, I actually heard Carol Littleton say that she was insulted if people complimented her on her editing because editing has always supposed to have been seamless and unseen. Uh, if you saw it, then something was wrong. And Scorsese and I uh, really believe just the opposite in a way. I mean, obviously, there are many times when you don't want the audience to notice what you're doing. But there are times when you do want to slap them in the face or disturb them by something unconventional. And I do think that that's one of the things that Scorsese has brought back into filmmaking, which comes out of our early involvement in documentaries, a deep influence of cinema verite and, and uh, the French New Wave on, on filmmaking, and of course a great deal of what the French New Wave was doing was, was created by economic necessity from what I understand, is that right? I mean, yeah. um, but we liked that, and uh, our documentary background encouraged us to like that. We were very much influenced by cinema verite filmmakers like Ricky Leacock, the sort of veracity and unafraid way he would lay things down and uh, that, that's been a big influence on So I think he's, he's brought that back into the mainstream, hopefully. But, so they were not really inventions? Well, um, the techniques are perhaps not inventions. The way he uses them is, is new and fresh, I think. No, I just thought you personally, in your craft, mm -hmm. whether, let's say, the craft of editing owes you a particular debt for a particular thing that you have originated. I don't think I'm the person to say. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it that way. Uh, we're always trying to find new ways to edit and, and new uh, uh, s sort of style to bring to the editing of each film. Uh, in The Age of Innocence, Scorsese wanted to really show, to use dissolves as brush strokes almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had that idea very originally. But of course, in the process of editing, there's a scene um, where there's a lot of food being served. There's two people in a conversation. And there you see the, the many courses that people used to eat in those days. Uh, and it was designed by him originally to, to have a lot of dissolves between the food, how the food was presented each time. Um, but, but there would be dialogue, and then there would be all these episodes with the food, and then more dialogue, and then episodes with the food. And what happened as we were cutting is we started 
invading the food with the dialogue. So pretty soon it all became one piece with the dialogue going over all of the dissolves of the courses and uh, jumping the time a bit. Um, so it's a combination of two things. He knew that he wanted to use dissolves in a unique way there, but it was it, once we got into the editing room that we really made it begin to work in a new way. What do you think is the most important quality an editor must have? Is it memory? Well, memory is very important. Uh, well, one of the first things I always do is memorize all the footage in the film. Uh, it's my job to remind the director if there's something that will help us out of a jam or if there's a better, perhaps a better performance. But the most important thing is probably, in the long run, strength, uh, patience, the ability to sustain over very, very long periods of time when your spirits can sag, when you think perhaps you're never going to be able to solve an editing problem where a scene isn't working and you, you begin to think you'll never get it right. Um, you need to be able to sustain and have patience and shore up a director who's sometimes shaken by uh, something that hasn't worked out the way he thinks it's, it should have worked out. Uh, you have to sort of be the base and the, and the calm, uh, sustaining force sometimes for someone who, who fears that something he's gambled on hasn't worked out. So I would say that if you're not a person with tremendous patience and tremendous stamina, um, don't go into editing. <laughs> there are many other characteristics which are very important, of course, but those are unfortunately some of the most important. It's a, it's a very quality. exhausting job, very exhausting, mm -hmm. and very, it's very hard to keep your spirits up over a long period of time like that, six months, eight months, sometimes a year, um, to keep your senses sharp for what the film is about, to not lose the edge, um, to not lose the ability to see it fresh on the screen. And uh, sometimes filmmakers, young filmmakers come up to me and say, do you ever get depressed? And I say, yes, we get depressed all the time. I mean, Three o'clock in the afternoon, we get depressed. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, it it it's 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 very uh, emotionally draining, and um, it's wonderful too. You know, I mean, it's I I'm just talking about a certain aspect of it, but uh, you may go to a preview with the film in front of an, an audience, and and uh, you'll feel certain things aren't working, and it's very hard to go in the next day and attack it and and try and correct what's wrong when you're you're very depressed. But somehow we always get through. But it does take an ability to sustain and an ability to, to hope and keep and keep your eye on on the end at times. It's um it's very exhausting. <laughs> What's the longest edit you've been on? Well, Raging Bull took a very long time to edit because we were waiting for De Niro to gain weight in between <laughs> certain um of the of the shootings. So we shot the, the fight sequences first when he was at his fighting weight and he had been training as a fighter for two years, so he was really he could have competed as a middleweight boxer at that time. So he was at the peak of physical perfection when we began. So we shot all the fight sequences first. It took six weeks, which is a very long time. Um, thank God Marty was given the luxury to shoot at that length uh, because each shot was so incredibly difficult that sometimes they only got one shot a day, which is extraordinary these days when you're supposed to get 15 a day. But they were so complicated that uh, it took that amount of time. So then, while he was gaining the next amount of weight, because he, he was only supposed to gain a certain amount of weight, we were editing those sequences. Then, when he'd gained that extra amount of weight, then they shot all the sequences where he was supposed to be that weight. Then we stopped again and were editing those sequences while he gained more weight. Uh, so it actually took us almost two years to finish that film. But I think we could have been pressured to do it quicker. It was, we just had the luxury of the time then. That's a very long time. What do you enjoy most? The moment when it's finished? Or is that a letdown? Uh, no, it's, it's not a letdown. I, I, enjoy the, I enjoy the doing of it. I enjoy the, the solving of the problems, the, the uh, cracking of it when uh, something you've been struggling with for a long time suddenly starts to work, when the film suddenly starts to move. I, I actually like, Scorsese likes the first cut the best because that's where he sees if all his ideas are working mm -hmm. or not. I like the second cut and the third cut because in the second cut and the third cut the film starts to move and find its rhythm and that's the most exciting time for me. But I must say the finishing is not necessarily the exciting time. The, the most exciting time is, is battling with it and winning, uh, finding solutions, getting it to move, getting the right rhythm because probably 50% of editing is rhythm. Uh, it doesn't matter how well it's shot, the editor still has to 
create a rhythm within, between the shots and between the actors and create character. Uh, and that, when I begin to start feeling that happening in the film, when I start feeling the film move on the screen, is, is the most exciting time for me. It's, it's the most important thing for us actually when it's finished is what our friends think of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the most important uh, reactions for us. Uh, and we allow very few people, very trusted people, to see the first cut, and then maybe a few more to see the second cut, and then more of the third cut. And, um, and then when it's finally done, what they think is what is the most exciting. How many cuts do you do on the average? It, it will depend on the film. I would say we do at least five to six entire cuts of the film. The first one, of course, always being the hardest when we're carving it out the first time. And um, that can take two months to three months. Then we screen it, and um, the second and the third cut can take a month or six weeks each. And then the fourth, fifth, sixth cuts, there, then it's getting quicker because we don't necessarily have to work on each scene. Mm -hmm. We're attacking areas that are a problem. You sometimes get the feeling when you're in a cutting room that you're out of touch, and that it's just you and the thing, and that somehow, when for the first time it comes out in the air, and somebody else sees it, that your view of it has been somehow impaired by the incestuousness of being in there? It's true. Um, uh, actually, uh, Scorsese and I try to only look at the first cut ourselves, because we're always pretty appalled by it. <laughs> we say, oh my god, what have we done? Uh, so we don't really like to share it with too many people. But all you need is one other person in the room. It could be anybody. It could be a taxi driver. If you just had him in the room with you, you suddenly see the film the way he sees it, and that teaches you a tremendous amount. Um, screening films is, is very, very important, and we do it as much as we possibly can, because just seeing it up there on the big screen changes everything. It changes the rhythm, the speed of the film, and what works and what doesn't work, it becomes very obvious you, to you what's too slow, uh, what's too fast, uh, how a character is drifting in the wrong direction, um, the texture of the film. Is the end working? Uh, would the end work better if you if the film was 15 minutes shorter? Uh, it's it's uh, it's wonderful because each film is an entirely different problem. It's uh, it's always a whole new ball game, uh, which is one of the great things about editing. So what happens? You go out and get a taxi driver, or you get, or you get Robert De Niro? <laughs> no, Robert De Niro come, would come uh, relatively late. Because um, he said taxi driver. If he's in the film. Uh, then he would probably be there relatively early. But uh, my husband, Michael Powell, was someone that Scorsese admired immensely. And during the time that he was living with me in New York, the day that Marty would allow him to see the film was always the big day, because he was always afraid he wouldn't like it. And if he didn't like it, Marty would have been devastated. So he always tended to wait and wait you know, to the fourth cut, to the fifth cut. <laughs> Finally, I would make him let him come. And uh, his reactions were always wonderful, uh, very fresh. and very helpful. Uh, and Marty would hear him laughing in the audience at certain things that only Michael would see that Marty had done as a director. Uh, so it was a very special time whenever he was allowed to come. But we do, I mean, there are two or three people that we trust that, that uh, and we know how to read their reactions also, that we allow to come in the, in the very early screenings. A lot of times friends won't tell you what goes on. Oh, that's very true, but uh, um, you actually learn how to read that. You know, by that the way, well, people yeah. yes, <laughs> people have um, ways they tell you if they if they don't like the film, they 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 come up with a sort of complicated um, euphemistic way of putting it, <laughs> and you know then that they don't like it. So oh, you, you get to read that pretty quickly. Yeah. Very interesting, though.